concerning the relationships between uh, assemblage theory and active network theories in the context of an ongoing empirical study I'm conducting into internet video. Uh, amateur video makers are used to the internet to distribute videos as the primary area of my research, based on an in-progress monograph uh, and also built on my doctoral research published some, some while ago and also on a published article that came out of that. It's based on a 12-month ethnography uh, done in the, uh, 2011 and 2012 and also on um, a three-month follow-up ethnography that's uh, just completed this year. And these ethnographies analyzed using active network theory and assemblage theory. Uh, and the three groups that I uh, research into are called the California Community Media Exchange, uh, which is a public access TV group in the United States, uh, a film and TV group um, around the Vivicon uh, fan convention, and also Vision on TV, which is a uh, UK video activist group, which will be the subject of uh, today's discussion. <coughs> So, the first question is which actor network theory and which assemblage theory am I using? Because there are many different varieties, particularly with uh, actor network theory. Uh, primarily, I'm using Latour and John Law with a little bit of Calon, uh, and also uh, a number of people who have applied these theories using their applications. Um, with this, and these are the different concepts I use just listed, I won't go through them all now. Uh, with respect to assembly theory, I'm uh, using um, the Lambda theory with a few uh, Deleuzian uh, words thrown in to for the reasons I go into a bit later. So the first question to ask, are these two theories compatible? And as uh, the previous presenters showed you John Law's quote, which is referenced here, and there's a few other people that also think they are very closely related to each other as theories. Uh, in addition to that, a number of uh, scholars use them um, as if they are compatible. So, for instance, they use um, active network theory concepts and assembly theory concepts together interchangeably. So, one example would be uh, Salabara's work on Pussy Riot, treating them as uh, a media assemblage, and they each use both uh, kinds of theories to describe that without really differentiating between the two. Similarly, other Rizzo does it with respect to um, multi-platform television, again using different terms. And Jane Bennett, with her study of the North American blackout, also uses uh, these terms interchangeably. Uh, Harmon, in another in other works, pushes for a distinction he thinks is very important between them. Although I don't think this distinction is particularly uh, convincing, he argues that because uh, Deleuze uh, is based on a uh, Bergsonian notion of time, which is continuous, and Latour is based on Whitehead's theory of time, which is, um, uh, which is discontinuous. Therefore, what happens is that assemblages are these unfolding, smoothly unfolding over time entities, whereas that the network theories come and go out of existence every moment in time. So you get one active network theory and a moment later it's a different one. And this is kind of his, his argument. This is a, to me, this is an entirely uh, uh, metaphysical distinction that really has no practical application. I've not read one active network theory application that's ever treated them in that way, as if they wink out of existence and come back into existence again. They, they always are treated within um, all the studies as being continuous. Uh, uh, continuous entities, very similar to how assemblies are treated. So I don't really think this is a, a, a serious uh, incompatibility. So for my purposes, I'm treating them as if they are compatible. But also, uh, importantly, um, I'm treating them as uh, complementary, and that's what that's the main thrust of today's today's presentation is just to talk about their complementary aspects. So before I do that, I'm going to illustrate these different complementary aspects, but before I do that, I need to explain the case study of which um, I'm going to apply those, uh, those theoretical aspects to. So it concerns Vision on TV, the um, video activist group I mentioned before. They produce activist videos. They, they upload those videos to YouTube and Blip, uh, which is another hosting service, or at least was, it no longer exists, and a collection of others. They then take... Uh, RSS feeds, which are syndication feeds, take a video from uh, YouTube and attach it to another platform, which is called Miro Community, which is like a video aggregation software. And then they embed that video aggregation software into something called LifeRay, which is a content management system. And then they 
provide links to those services from their Facebook and Twitter accounts. Plus they have a whole collection of volunteers they also use to support this, this service. And in addition to that, they had an ambition of having this platform adopted by a lot of other activists as well. So having it as a, a wider assembly and connecting platform. So this is kind of a complex technological solution they, they had. And so to analyze that, uh, we can look through the different as the complementary aspects of active network theory and assembly theory to understand how they, um, how they apply. So for instance, if we think about from active network theory, we have the idea of uh, the translation of interests, which um, happened with respect to the volunteers. So that they had volunteers who wanted to get involved as activists with their short-term interest, but they had long-term interests to get employment at some point. And because it was a, um, an activist organization, they didn't have any money, so they couldn't pay anybody. And also, because Vision on TV wasn't a recognized brand in the media industry, having it on their CV didn't really help them, these volunteers. So their long-term interests of um, getting employment became inconsistent with their short-term interests, and eventually their enrollment within the assemblage failed. It's very similar to uh, Callon's case of, if you're familiar with it, of the, the scholar fisherman um, in France, whose short-term interests were temporarily suspended so they could see a long-term interest in having the bay repopulated with scholars, I'm familiar with this example. Uh, it's a very kind of similar break between short-term and long-term interest. So that's kind of one way of thinking about it. But assemblage theory gives us another perspective, which is the homogenization aspect of their, their training. So what happened was that the volunteers uh, were instilled with principles of vision on TV, which was to use open access software, which was to use software that was for free, which was to be committed to having this wider assemblage, which was to produce videos with a particular kind of format. And so it was a territorialization process to get them all to share the same uh, values and keep them and uh, homogenize them in that respect. So this kind of so in terms of process of stabilization and formation, you can see that at the network theory and assemblage theory put the focus on different areas, one's on interest, one's on homogenization. So that's one example of thinking about it. There's also the question of, uh, of when you think about components, active network theory, uh, sorry, assemblage theory talks about capabilities and whether they're sorry, capacities and whether they're uh, material or uh, expressive components, like what, what, what to the material or expressive, where assemblage theory concentrates on being mediators or intermediaries. Uh, again, I haven't got time to go into illustrate that point, but that's another uh, complementary feature, I believe. Also, when you think, and I call it, I'm using the term arrangements here because I don't want to, I'm not prejudicing it by saying assemblage or active networks, I'm sort of calling them both arrangements for the moment. When you think about the arrangements in general, you have uh, the properties of assemblages emerge from the process of acting upon the components. But with active network theory, it's more concerned about tracing associations that are created by those processes and also focusing on the notion of work. And that becomes quite critical in some of these uh, studies. For instance, within the Vision on TV, their founding members had to work a lot to keep this very complex assemblage of people and machines stabilized. And they had limited capacity for work. And as that became uh, expended, then the system destabilized. So work then becomes an important notion to think about, which the tour stresses uh, a number of times. But also the idea of um, diagrams adds an important aspect from assemblage theory to think about uh, to think about the process of what's going on. So what happened between uh, 2012 and now with uh, Vision on TV is that they um, stopped producing videos and questioned their whole process of what they were doing. And so with active network theory, you're caught in the relentless actuality of the world. You're going through your ethnography, you're going from one thing to another, whatever happens next, and you, you keep going from one step to the other, tracing associations. With assemblage theory, you can step back, have a theoretical space, to think about these things, a virtual space in which to think about it. So for vision on TV, what this does is that it allows you to think about them. If they were an activist network before, a video activist network sitting, let's say, if you imagine a virtual space, a diagram of video activism, 
with that particular diagram, diagram space. Within that, there's historical examples of, in the UK in the 1970s of these things called workshops, which are video activists of a particular kind. Um, and there are other ones that came later, which are another one was called Undercurrents, which was the precursor for visual TV. So you can imagine them sitting in a diagrammatic space. And then what happens is that so if Vision on TV stops producing videos and only distributes them, are they still considered part of that? So they're deterritorialized um, out of, are they re-territorializing within the space to become another uh, entity, let's say another um, establishment of the universal, sorry, adopt the position of another universal singularity in that space, or are they crashing out of that space altogether into something different? So it allows that discussion to take place, which you really couldn't do successfully, or you couldn't do in the same way using active network theory, because it's, it's really, active network theory would just what you trace the different associations that happened over that time without being able to step back and, and virtualize it. You know. The other complementary aspect is when you think about arrangements of arrangements, right, assemblages. So, um, with uh, the use of terms of molar and molecular, you can think about what Vision on TV was doing as a project. So, for instance, they had their own platform that they were creating, and you can think of that on a relative scale as the molecular assemblage, and then beyond that, there was this molar assemblage they were trying to create, which is all these different activist groups that were trying to connect up together. So you can have this kind of concept of this relative scale. Of course, then you can go down to the next level and look at Vision on TV as a molar assemblage, which is then composed of these different molecular assemblages like YouTube and so forth, which themselves are assemblages. And so you can go up and down this hierarchical system, which becomes very important because a lot of these systems start breaking down and then you need to go into their specificity so you move up and down through that collection of the hierarchical scale. Whereas that network theory, the ideas of black boxes and masking become very useful uh, because you can imagine when you have a situation where you have a when active network theory is considered an uh, intermediary, so when you have like a YouTube or Blip video hosting services, when they're working correctly, you don't notice they're there. They're just functioning normally and you treat them as intermediary. They're not really doing anything. They're, just, they're in the background. But if they break down, then suddenly they become, the, the fact that the mediators becomes apparent. You see their specificity, uh, what's going on with them. So in this example, um, the video that was going from the hosting service on Blip was going into their platform via an RSS feed. It started feeding the wrong videos. And instead of being activist videos, there were celebrity videos. Uh, and, uh, and then the Vision on TV had to look at that, go back into the assemblage, look at the connection between Blip and, and their platform to see what was going on. Why had this broken down? And what happened is that Blip had changed something in their uh, software which meant that it had a knock-on effect. So then Blitner had to be considered, instead of also being an intermediary, it had to be considered as a mediator, its specificity in the network. So black boxing you allow, it draws your attention to these, these questions and issues. There are also other considerations to think about. Um, active network theory, many scholars have been working on it for a long time now. There are a lot of empirical case studies, there are a lot of, a lot of examples, uh, but it's a mess. You know, it's like there's 101 active network theories. It's really uh, confusing if you're trying to get into it and understand what's going on. Whereas assemblage theory, the way I'm using it with, uh, with the Landers uh, version, is very systematic, it's, it's, very, it's very clear. And so when you're in the middle of writing uh, complex work using these theories, sometimes you get lost and you've got to find a touchstone to go back to. And active network theory doesn't really provide that, whereas assemblage theory does give you this kind of clarity to use. So I think that's also uh, complementary aspect of it. So just to conclude on this, I think that using both what, what I found, it's not even my opinion, it's what I found in, in producing, so I'm, writing, I'm trying to write uh, this book, I've written one chapter on vision on TV, I've got to write two other chapters so it's like on other case studies, so it's about 33,000 words of case study analysis. So you need a broad range of conceptual tools, just from a Pros, natural pros point of view, you get very you can't say territorialization that many times on a page where it looks a bit weird. So you, you get you get a wider conceptual, so you get a wider um, set of conceptual tools. You also, lots of different applications that you can draw upon, and also you can draw upon different scholars' perspectives. So as you're trying to find perspectives and shades and nuances within these very complex case studies, and today it's been hard to uh, give you these examples because there's such complexity in them. And, and the problem with active network theory is that 
It loves the complexity. It's kind of about digging into the complexity. So I had to give you like a very brief summary of it. But you need the shades and nuances to really understand you know, what's going on. So there are outstanding questions. One simple question is, is what to call them. If you're combining them together, you call them assemblages. I know that Law, Law and Latour have on occasion used the word assemblage to refer to active networks. But the casual reader can misunderstand that and think you're talking about something else. And those casual readers can be uh, PhD examiners and they can also be book reviewers in both cases. Have, have been confused by the use of the word uh, assemblage when I'm actually talking about it as an active network. So do you then interchange between the two? I don't know the answer to that. I think I'd like to you know, need to think more about that. And also some of the concepts that I'm using, some seem to be used more than others. So the, instant, the idea of components' roles being material or expressive and the degree to which they are, I haven't found that analytically that useful in my case study, in the first one, well, the ones that I've done also previously. I'm not sure why that is, whether there's some, there's some analytical element that I haven't been able to uh, uncover that uh, maybe is there. Also, spatial territorialization hasn't been used very much. It's mostly been about homogeneity. And I think that's partly because I'm dealing in a virtual space. So maybe I can expand the idea of spatial to actually talk about virtual space as treatment. YouTube can be a space, or Facebook can be a space, and then talk about it in those terms. And the other question is uh, with Harmon, you know, should these, these theories be harmonized, literally in the sense of Harmon? Because he believes that I think that object oriented ontology is really the way forward. And these two theories are sort of partial understandings of what, he's, what he wants to do. I don't know enough about his theory to, to say, but it's an interesting question to see whether is that just him trying to quite fairly promote his own agenda, or is there something in that is object-orientated ontology somehow relevant to these two theories? Thank you very much.